Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, this is great. Uh, thank you all very much for, for coming today, this afternoon. It's uh, really wonderful to see, to see all of you. Um, I planned it, got the room, had some uh, refreshments over in the back room, and I thought I had everything under control. And then Matthias approached me a while ago and said, what about introductions? I was like, I all about that. <laughs> so I had to do kind of a self-introduction. Uh, <laughs> but it's okay, I think all of you, all of you uh, know me, I know, I know all of you, and it's all, uh, it was really good to, um, to be here. Um, I am the um, Sister Margaret Patrice Slattery Chair in English for 2012 uh, to uh, 2015, and it is um, uh, a wonderful honor that we, we have in our, in our department. The previous holder of this chair is uh, Dr. Joe LeCour, who uh, was able to make it also, I appreciate that. Um, and just before her, uh, it was Dr. Pat Lanchar, who is over here. And uh, before uh, Pat, it was uh, Dr. Chappelle. <laughs> uh, and then we kind of lost track of things. And who was it before that? Uh, and it was um, uh, back to Stuart Silver. Stuart Silver was uh, the, the first one who, uh, who held this, uh, this, this position. Um, so I want to acknowledge all of you present today. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Margaret, uh, uh, our Dean, Dr. Uh, Healy. Um, Jeff, our associate, is it associate or assistant? Yeah, associate. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Previous dean, uh, Bob, Bob Connolly, a provost Kathy Lund, a registrar even. Our library liaison, uh, Leslie Todd, uh, someone that we're very happy to work with. Uh, you're the, the other one? The library. You know, so I'm very, very pleased that all of you are, are here. Um, I also want to take this uh, opportunity to thank my colleagues for uh, bestowing upon me this uh, this great honor. Um, I also apologize for the um, potential conflict or overlap with uh, the other, the, the great event going on today, <laughs> which is um, our president's spaghetti dinner. And I think uh, I was told that someone wanted to come, but then they had to leave early because they had a commitment to, uh, to, to go to that. Um, it, it, this, today, uh, uh, the date uh, turned out to be one of those uh, not much choice uh, situations. Uh, I think all of you saw me earlier this year with, uh, with a sling. Uh, yeah, I had uh, uh, shoulder surgery over the summer and I was recovering from that. And I, I didn't want to be doing this while I had the sling. And, uh, a few days before I was told I was going to be out of the sling, I made the arrangements, and this was this was it. Uh, we're a very very busy campus uh, nowadays. I know I've told several of my colleagues that I remember a time when uh, we had um, two or three activities a week, and we were all expected to attend, and most of us would. Right? But it's been years now that we've got uh, three, four, five activities a day, uh, and it's um, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, Another thing that many of you know is that uh, this talk, or a very similar one, was uh, scheduled uh, for the end of the spring semester. Uh, I think it was April. And I had to cancel those plans also, as, as uh, many of you here know, on account of my mother's health. Uh, she has been in hospice now for, for over a year. Uh, she was 93 years old earlier this year, and she's still hanging on and amazing us. Um, her immediate and extended family, as well as the, the, the hospital staff, and uh, uh, Adela is doing, us the, uh, doing me the favor of, of recording this. I'm going to share this talk with her. I'm, I'm dedicating this talk to my mother, Margarita Gutierrez uh, Perez, uh, who has been my greatest teacher and who has influenced me in ways that are still being revealed to me. Uh, one of my greatest regrets is not seeing this uh, earlier in my life. <clears throat> When I first planned this lecture uh, at the beginning of the year, when Sonia Sotomayor's uh, memoir was published, uh, I had a particular goal, uh, to thoroughly read the book and analyze it through the critical lenses at my disposal and organize my observations and share with the extended UIW community uh, audience. Um, and if we were very lucky, maybe even Sister Margaret uh, would be present. 
and lo and behold, <laughs> she, is, she is here. Um, I did read the book, uh, My Beloved World, uh, and I had my, my critical paraphernalia on, at hand. Um, I had Hippolytane's uh, historical and biographical context approach. Uh, the traditional approach, many of us were tutored in before the emergence of um, uh, the many uh, formalist approaches. Um, I, of course, had my close reading checklist formulated by the American New Critics. <laughs> and following the developments of the structuralists and even more so the post-structuralists, I set about to dissect the text. So the text under consideration is My Beloved World, a memoir written by the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, appointed by President Barack Obama and sworn in in 2009. The appointment of Justice Sotomayor is significant on several counts. She became only the third woman to be named to our highest court. Sandra Day O'Connor uh, nominated by uh, President Reagan and sworn in in 1981. She also retired in 06. Ruth uh, uh, Bader, uh, Ginsburg was nominated by President Clinton and sworn in in 1993. Elena Kagan was the fourth woman nominated to the Supreme Court and also by, uh, by Obama. Uh, Kagan was sworn in in 2010. No question, witnessing women named to the Supreme Court is wonderful and historic. Four female Supreme Court justices in that court's history, out of a total of 112 justices. Um, I have a little side note here, right? Uh, just like Senator Rand Paul, I consulted Wikipedia. <laughs> Him, unlike him, though, I am acknowledging the source. <laughs> in, the case, in the case of Sotomayor, perhaps as significant for some of us, I think, is the fact that she became the first Latina to be named Supreme Court Justice. Absolutely fantastic. That is an historic event that many of us were very aware of. Perhaps some of you remember all the media coverage around, uh, around her nomination and then the, uh, into the confirmation. Um, <clears throat> so this book, uh, this memoir as text is some kind of mimetic facsimile of this person's life. And to the extent that her life increasingly impacted more and more people, the mimesis of her life is, uh, is, is, the mimesis is of her life and of American culture and history. Our author, and here I use the possessive pronoun more literally and less so in the tradition of the 18th century uh, British writing, uh, as her ethnicity invites me to feel a closeness to her that I really didn't feel for the other Supreme Court appointees. Our author, as I was saying, identifies this text as a personal memoir. And perhaps in keeping with her legal training and need for clarity and terms up front, she elaborates, <coughs> I'm quoting, a memoir, as I understand it, makes no pretense of denying its subjectivity. Its matter is one person's memory, and memory by nature is selective and colored by emotion." Close quote. There appears to be no shortage of scholarship and a good range of discussions on distinguishing characteristics of, uh, of memoir. Professor John Kilstrom notes, quote, while biographies make use of documentary records, memoirs are, almost by definition, literary representations of memory. And so, like memories, they may be inaccurate or willfully distorted. Memories are representations of memory, not of history." Close quote. Uh, Kilstrom, interestingly, is a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley with research interests in cognition. He hosts a website which he says is part of a larger project called Human Ecology of Memory. In the website, he quotes the writer Dorothy Gallagher <clears throat> to further distinguish memoir from biography and autobiography. Uh, Gallagher says, Everything that happened is not in my stories. Uh, that is biographies, which is what she writes. How could it be? Memory is selective. Storytelling insists on itself. But there is nothing in my stories that did not happen. In their essence, they are true." Close quote. Gallagher's acknowledgment of the power or lure of storytelling is something Sotomayor also recognizes. Sotomayor explains in her preface, uh, quote, I have taken no liberties with the past as I remember it, used no fictional devices beyond reconstructing conversations from memory, and yet I have tried to tell a good story. If particular friends or family members find themselves not mentioned or are disappointed to see their roles rendered as less prominent than they might have expected, I hope they will understand that the needs of a clear and focused telling 
must outweigh even an abundance of feeling. <clears throat> Close quote. This storytelling aspect raised, raised itself like a flag, beckoning me to reach for one of my tools. Uh, if it's story or storytelling, it must be narration. And where there is narration, one can fruitfully use narratology. This approach to the development uh, of, of the formalists and later um, by the uh, structuralists. According to Mika Bal, narratology refers to, quote, the ensemble of theories of narratives, narrative texts, images, spectacles, events, cultural artifacts that tell a story. Bal's text is in its third edition, and in it, in it she has extended her work well beyond the early, often referred to as classical narratology of Gerard uh, Jeanette. Jeanette's texts, Narrative Discourse and Narrative Discourse Revisited, are like manuals to consult to dismantle linguistic compositions of any length or complexity. One can get lost in the analysis of minutiae such as order, duration, uh, where am I? Order, duration, and frequency. Uh, order here refers to the order in which events are narrated or uh, narrated as opposed to when they occur. Duration refers to how much textual space the narrative devotes to particular events or scenes. Frequency refers to how often narrative um, events are recounted. I recall applying this approach and ending up with an impressive inventory of parts, so to speak. However, I wasn't always sure about what to do with all those parts. Scholars tell us that structuralist analysis does not provide an interpretation. One way to state this is to equate the story with the signified and the narrative with the signifier. Narratological analysis examines the how of texts, not the what. Recall that my early literary training emphasized historical and biographical contexts. With early narratology, I had my hands deep into the elements of language. I attempted using this approach in a reading of Ngugi Wationgo's uh, novel, Petals of Blood. <clears throat> I was able to trace the instances of blood or anything that was read that might be associated with blood. Uh, when were they mentioned? How often were these images repeated? How much narration was devoted to them? My sense was that the power of that novel was not in the counting of those images. Likewise, I used this approach in, reading, uh, in a reading of Joyce's story, Grace, uh, about a troubled priest. Yes, there was much narration devoted to images of and allusions to drunkenness and loss of control. My sense there was that there is no need to do any linguistic bookkeeping to feel the impact of the story's critique of the priest specifically and of the Catholic Church more generally. So I ended up acknowledging some discrepancy between the analytical activity uh, and an appreciation for the totality of the story or narrative. In 1966, the writer Susan Sontag published Against Interpretation and other essays. Maybe some of you remember that one. Sontag's essay addresses the history of, uh, of art that is of its reception. Earlier modes of interpretation, she, sa she says, were, quote, respectful. They erected another meaning on top of the literal one, a closed quote. She says that modern, which would include our contemporary uh, interpretation, quote, excavates. And as it excavates, it destroys, it digs. It digs behind the text to find a subtext, which is the true one. Close quote. So interpretation requires analysis. Interpretation of a work of art is like dissecting something that is or was alive. Dissecting a work of art requires killing it. I remembered that image from Sontag's essay. Yet it seems ironic that her argument against interpretation would lead to a recommendation that the kind of commentary and criticism that is needed should focus on form in art. Among the critics she recommends are Northrop Fry, he of The Anatomy of Criticism, some of you will remember that uh, a famous text, and Roland Barthes, uh, one of my favorite structuralists and post-structuralists. She concludes by saying that, quote, the function of criticism should be to show how it is what it is, rather than to show what it means. As a practitioner in the discipline of English and literary studies, just like my colleagues, uh, most of you uh, here, uh, I have tried to keep up with the latest developments. As teachers, we have the challenge of bringing as much of these developments in some digestible form to our students, our majors, and those who take our courses to satisfy the core requirements. 
I suspect my colleagues, like me, encounter some resistance to theoretical approaches, especially when we dissect texts that were fine for the students, that were fine, even beautiful, when alive and perhaps a bit mysterious. There have been times when I felt I needed to be able to describe how one of those beautiful texts was organized internally. While I did think Jeanette's narratology was overkill, that's an intended pun, <laughs> uh, I was not totally discouraged nor dissuaded from considering narratology again. Fortunately, uh, Mika Bal came along and published her version, Narratology, Introduction to the Theory of Narrative, uh, in three editions. Um, she dis distanced herself a bit from Jeanette in the first edition, then more so in the second. In the second edition, Bal's theory displays the influence of post-structuralism, specifically the acknowledgement that most texts are open to a variety of interpretations, and she further incorporates Bakhtin's theory of dialogism. Bal openly states that in the third edition, she is interested in taking her narratology into film studies. The third edition also stresses that, quote, reading is, a, is of a subjective nature, close quote. Twice I've used Bal in my courses here at UIW, most recently in the fall of 2012 in our capstone senior seminar. I turn to Bal for a useful approach in analyzing uh, Sotomayor's memoir. Taking Bal's approach, I intended to examine the point regarding the narrator as focalizer. I especially was interested in exploring what we can learn about narrators by virtue of their focalizations. Regarding focalization, Bal explains that, quote, a choice is made from among the various points of view from which the elements can be presented. The resulting focalization, that is, the relation between who perceives and what is perceived, colors the story with subjectivity." Close quote. Taking that approach, I came up with a working title for my reading of the memoir, and it was Faces and Voices in Sotomayor's My Beloved World. Certainly, there was no question that Sotomayor was the author and narrator of the story. Granted, it may be reasonable to think that she had some very good editorial help, given her very busy, uh, how busy she might be, uh, we imagine that she's very busy. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is supposed to be the person, Sonia, Sonia Sotomayor, who is telling us her life story. The question for me was, which Sonia Sotomayor is doing the telling? Especially given, given the various and at times conflicting reports of just who she was and where her true loyalties lay. Um, maybe some of you remember <coughs> when she was nominated and she was being uh, asked all kinds of things uh, before the confirmation um, that she had uh, ruled in favor of uh, power plants uh, and again against the EPA. Uh, she was also uh, accused of uh, ruling against journalists in favor of news organizations, corporations like New York Times. So all these, all these issues were, were brought to the, uh, you know, to the forefront regarding uh, her and who she really was, that kind of thing. Um, those of you who have read the memoir, memoir will recall that she deliberately ends the narrative in 1993, or about 20 years ago. She pieces together from her own memory and from others' accounts of events which she would not directly know of the story of her life, which includes important events experienced by her parents. I believe I have already revealed my bar bias regarding Justice Sotomayor, and I feel very much okay about that. Years ago, I had the opportunity to attend a criticism and theory conference which featured uh, Judith Butler. Uh, and she impressed upon me, as well as everyone in the audience, but I felt like she was talking to me, uh, <laughs> uh, that it was important as responsible scholars to acknowledge, even if only to ourselves, uh, what our biases were. We need to approach our work aware of where we're coming from. Um, and Baal, uh, uh, as, as a narratologist, uh, tells us that reading is, of course, subjective. Uh, there's more subjectivity to come in my comments regarding uh, uh, Soto Mayor. Uh, so what I did is I came up with, um, with an inventory, an initial inventory, I should say, of possible faces and voices in, um, in, in the memoir. Uh, I'm gonna read uh, uh, some of these um, uh, entries that I've got as a list, and then I'm going to uh, uh, focus on several of them and, and kind of flesh them out. Uh, there's this image of her as, um, uh, as an exile, right? Uh, 
someone from, from Puerto Rico. She's, she was born in, in New York, though. Right? Uh, and throughout the memoir, she uh, develops herself, presents herself as a very devoted and patriotic US citizen. Uh, there are passages where she presents herself as being very independent, uh, a, a survivor, and very self-sufficient. Uh, there's some other passages where we see her as maybe a little dependent. Uh, I've got this in, in quotation marks, uh, clingy. I think that it may have been from her boyfriend who then became her, her husband. Um, liberal, conservative, enabler, a tough love practitioner, arbitrator slash mediator, uh, especially between her mother and father, uh, cautious, curious and rambunctious. Uh, we know from the very beginning that uh, uh, she uh, was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. Uh, there's some passages that reveal her to be somewhat su superstitious. <clears throat> She's optimistic, idealistic, uh, not self-made. She is neglected daughter by both parents. Very observant, even as a child. Uh, Catholic school student. <clears throat> Blessed Sacrament and then uh, uh, Cardinal Spellman High School. Um, advocate for, for uh, the underclass. At the same time that she avoids this uh, victim mentality. Very much a TV child. Mainstream and acculturated. She admires Puerto Rican culture yet can be realistically critical of Puerto Rican culture. The intellectual, very sensitive, very much a reader. <clears throat> Since narration uh, in this memoir is of so much interest to me, I must comment on some of its qualities. The memoir is, of course, written by Sotomayor as an adult. Even as Sotomayor, the adult who has already reached a quite high level of accomplishment, However, because her early years are so important to her development, personal, social, intellectual, and professional, she must recount early experiences. I think the narrative very effectively creates a persona of the child, of the child Sonia, as someone who is quite sensitive and very observant. She is studious, and we learn that she is a very strong reader. These are characteristics that are very typical of the Bildungsroman novel. Uh, one literary term glossary defines uh, the Bilus Roman as, quote, a novel that deals with the development of a young person, usually from adolescence to maturity. It is frequently autobiographical, close quote. So let's look a little, uh, uh, a bit more closely at what I'm calling these uh, first person narrator slash character markers. Right? That's me under the influence of narratological analysis. Let me locate all these little things. So, as early as in the memoir's prologue, Sotomayor foregrounds the very important fact that she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Yes, a terrible thing. In her immediate environment, her culture, her family, this disease was considered a curse. It runs in families, como una maldición. She remembers her abuelita, the paternal uh, grandmother, saying, and even more specifically, this curse is from Selena's side. For sure, not ours. <laughs> Close quote. Yet, Sotomayor, even as a child, senses she needed to do something to take care of herself out of a sense of survival. Because of the contentious relationship between her parents, she couldn't really count on either of them. So she learned how to monitor herself and inject herself with insulin. Uh, while the image of an amazing and precocious child is certainly created, this image is qualified. She acknowledges that, uh, that they, her family, uh, were fortunate to li live in New York City, a major center for so many things, including medical research. What a coincidence that there was a hospital that was, the leading, uh, that was leading the way in juvenile uh, diabetes research. Likewise, she acknowledges a doctor, Dr. Fisher, who treated her and taught her how to take care of herself. I see this person, Dr. Fisher, as one of many who act as mentors for Sonia. Uh, uh, throughout, throughout the memoir. On top of that historical and geographical good fortune, our young narrator starts to learn to be self-reliant. She says, quote, but the disease also inspired in me a kind of precocious self-reliance that is not uncommon in children who feel the adults around them are unreliable, close quote. Some readers might take this observation as validation of the 
uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. I think uh, that that's a, a common phrase, you're all familiar with that. Um, and perhaps Sotomayor anticipated this kind of response. Uh, she is quick to add, quote, at the same time, I would never claim to be self-made, quite the contrary. At every stage of my life, I have always felt that the support I've drawn from those closest to me has made the decisive difference between success and failure. And this was true from the beginning. Whatever their limitations and frailties, those who raised me loved me and did the best they, know, they knew how. Of that, I am sure." Close quote. One of the recurring themes I see in this memoir is the idea that even in bad or difficult situations, there must be something good or at least useful that can be gained. Given her birth year, she falls into the group known as baby boomers, uh, like some of us here. As a baby boomer, she is very much a child of the TV generation. Note that her family didn't always have a TV. This detail is here as a socioeconomic class marker. The family was poor and struggling. Yet the fact that the family gets a TV also indicates uh, signs of <coughs> mobility, but there's more. <clears throat> so Tomayo recalls how quiet, too quiet, it was at home when her mother was working the second shift and sometimes the third shift. Her father would make dinner for them, and it was always something very delicious. But after making dinner, he would retreat to his room, presumably to imbibe in his drink. Sonia and her brother would be alone for the rest of the evening. Getting a TV was a very welcome uh, event because, as she says, it was no longer so quiet. But TV did more than break the silence. It gave her models of all sorts. She watched silly shows like The Three Stooges, and like some of us as kids, uh, she mimicked Curly. Um, I don't know if any of you can imagine our Justice Sonia Sotomayor at some point in her life doing the the arm thing, you know, <laughs> the yuck, 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 you know, and all of that. Uh, but she did. Uh, with her family, she enjoyed the Ed Sullivan Show, uh, that wonderful variety show that ran, uh, oh, well, who knows how many years, but a long time. Um, reading this reminded me of the very pleasant time uh, I spent with my family at home watching the same show. Uh, singers, juggling acts, um, uh, that puppet Topo Gijo. Uh, <laughs> Sotomayor mentions an interesting uh, pseudo-political comment about some family members, older ones, not liking the show The Man From UNCLE. Maybe some of you remember that show? Um, she says that uh, some older family members did not like that show because there was a Soviet protagonist. You know, very pro-US, and therefore you can't you know, watch or accept anything like that. Um, the Ed Sullivan Show, as everyone must know, was a very important venue for the pop music superstars, the Beatles. So Tomayor mentions her young teen infatuation with Ringo. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> These references, revelations, and descriptions all endear us to our narrator. Another TV show that she mentions, which I would say is even more significant than Sotomayor's development, is Perry Mason. She was intrigued by this courtroom drama, and I believe that her close reading of these episodes, uh, Raymond Burr as Perry Mason, uh, Barbara Hale as uh, Della Street, uh, William uh, Hopper as Paul Drake. And there were at least two actors who played the, the assistant DAs. <clears throat> Very good, an interesting, uh, uh, popular show. Uh, I know someone, I think uh, well by now, who was at least as intrigued as Sonia Sotomayor watching those TV shows. And it's my wife, Velma. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when, I find, when I finally met uh, uh, her parents, one of the memories they shared with me of her as a child was her fascination with that show and the, sus the suspense that would build up to that declaration, murder in the first degree. <laughs> <laughs> but Sotomayor, interestingly and charmingly, admitted to enjoying the hunt for evidence and designing of strategies, yet realized at some point that there was an authority above the DA and even above Perry Mason, and that was the judge. So at an early age, she imagined that being a judge would be the ultimate goal. As suggested uh, um, above, a little earlier here, uh, I came up with a possible, with a list of possible faces and or voices in Sotomayor's memoir. Um, I will consider one or two more, uh, I don't want to concern for, for our time. Um, Sotomayor shares with us some of her um, academic experiences. In earlier grades, all the way up through high school, college, and law school, my colleagues here, perhaps university faculty and administrators elsewhere, have referred to 
persistence as an important characteristic in student success. Uh, I think Sonia Sotomayor certainly possessed that, uh, and perhaps to the point of impersonifying that quality. Uh, she did possess strengths and talents to do well in school, but we must admit that she also faced numerous challenges and obstacles. Without beating her own drum too loudly, she asked herself on several occasions why she did well and others in her community did not. And the person that she had my, in mind in particular is her cousin Nelson, someone that she grew up with, and he, in, in some areas, was even a stronger student than, than Sonia, yet he went, went a different path. Um, at, at some point, he um, uh, develops AIDS, and uh, there's kind of a separation. She tried to keep in touch with him, et cetera, but what she was saying is, okay, um, if, if not, if I made it, you know, others can make it. It's, it there's more, there's more to that. Um, she has observed that, uh, that her cousin was at least as uh, talented scholastically, perhaps even stronger than she was in some areas. Um, and while she explores that, she has no, no good answer. Um, in the recounting of her school experiences, we see that she valued reason over emotion, very classical and neoclassical, and took pride in her analytical skills. She even realized that if she uh, was serious about law, she would need to develop speaking skills. So she made it a point to get on the debating team and to stick with it. I want to contrast this side, or face, of Sonia's, uh, the reasonable, rational self, against the Sonia who displayed a tendency toward belief in, um, I couldn't find a, a, a better word, uh, superstitions. Um, maybe the supernatural, the, the, su the spiritual realm. Um, but anyway, there, there's this contrast. This happens after her father passes away. Um, and she swears she could sense his presence right? uh, there at home. And on, on numerous occasions, she just knew that, that, that he was there. Uh, but this is dramatized even further. Um, Sonia uh, Sotomayor recalls an incident at her um, abuelitas. And she, as she pieced the story together, as she tells us, quote, as I nodded off in the midst of prayers, I apparently spoke in a strange voice one that sounded like Abuelita's long dead sister to those who remembered her, a voice my grandmother might summon during one of her seances. The message I delivered was that my father was safely in her company. There was no need to worry. Conformate, I said, accept it, close quote. She adds that uh, nothing like that had ever happened to her before and that nothing like that has happened since. Uh, I'm pretty sure this experience was not mentioned in any of her background checks or <laughs> nomination for any of her, her judgeships. Um, another pair of narrator slash character markers casts Sotomayor as a prosecutor who is tough on crime. At Yale Law School, um, <clears throat> at Yale Law School, and, cont and she continued to learn from others, uh, uh, and she developed her own talents and skills. She benefited from her acquaintance with um, a person by the name of Jose Cabranes. She first met him when she was an undergraduate at Princeton. Uh, Cabranes was co-founder of the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund, very similar to our uh, MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. <clears throat> when Sotomayor is at Yale, Cabranes, who had also already been special counsel to the governor of Puerto Rico, was now Yale's general counsel. He becomes another important mentor for Sotomayor. While that is, of course, impressive and, and important, uh, it is also important to note that when it came time for Sotomayor to go job hunting uh, after Yale, she entertained, uh, she entertained <coughs> several private firm possibilities, but decided on a position with the DA's office in New York City, much to the dismay of many of her friends and her mentor, Cabranes. Uh, Anyway, she takes the position with the DA's office and becomes, and uh, becomes, uh, uh, as is characteristic for her, uh, learning very quickly and taking her work very seriously. She is assigned a variety of cases and her experiences and adventures are vividly described. We see her, for example, uh, maybe you'll remember this, Sister Margaret. We see her, for example, in a scene where she is on the back of a motorcycle chasing down a van up and down New York City streets because they didn't want to lose the suspect. They had called the police, but they hadn't shown up yet, so uh, she and a, another investigator right, are chasing after this van. <clears throat> uh, the crime uh, she was working was possession and sales of counterfeit uh, Major League Baseball items. Uh, 
baseball caps, <laughs> t-shirts, pennants, those kinds of things. This was during the 1986 World Series, and I don't know, maybe it was very valuable. Uh, the chase scene is described quite vividly, I think worthy of a TV or movie chase scene. <clears throat> However, she realized after that chase that she had literally risked her life and it dawns on her that no amount of baseball caps, counterfeit or not, was worth that. <laughs> uh, we also see her working uh, full force in a sex crimes uh, unit. She is fully committed to prosecuting perpetrators, especially those targeting children. Her dedication and the quality of her work earn her respect and recognition. She is offered a position to lead a new unit with additional resources, but she admits that that particular kind of work had taken too much out of her. Uh, the crime fighter of knowledge reaching her limits. She couldn't do it in, in any of that uh, uh, anymore. Um, so she reaches a point in her uh, legal career where she decides that it was time to move into private legal work. She spent uh, very important years working at Pavia and Harcourt. Uh, this truly is yet another uh, new world for little Sonia from the Bronx. Her clients here included uh, Fendi, Ferrari, and uh, Prada. <laughs> Because of the author's early background and eventual rise to success, there may be a temptation to uh, want to see this memoir as a rags to riches story, um, along the lines of the Horatio Alger stories of uh, the turn of the century, like the previous century. <laughs> <clears throat> I shared with you instances of very good fortune or luck. Uh, um, however, given the depth of details and characterization, uh, and what I might call some loose threads, this memoir is not a rags to riches story. For instance, her marriage fails quite quickly. Um, while she foregrounds her specific Puerto Rican culture at every opportunity, she seems to not reap some of the joys of, um, well, what some of us might see as, as, as stereotypical, but uh, uh, I think there's, there's quite a bit of truth to this, the, the joys of extended family. Um, for example, I sympathized with her uh, missing out on physical displays of affection, uh, los abrazos y besos, or the hugs and, and kisses. Uh, she does not have children, at least not in this memoir, uh, but admits the joy of spending time with her nieces and nephews. Uh, she notes, quote, I wrote to myself a prescription for hug therapy. I told each of the children in my life that I wasn't getting enough hugs. Tommy, Vanessa, Zachary, uh, and this is a quote to them. Would you help me out by giving me a hug whenever you see me? Kylie didn't need telling, of course, but every one of the others got it instantly. In this, the wisdom of toddlers is unassailable. The hugs came, and feeling flowed that had never come so easily before. Even as the kids grew into gangly teenagers, the hugs never stopped. Younger siblings, John and Kyle, would join the cause as the years went by. What I've learned from children, I've been able to give back to adults. The stroke of the arm that says I understand. The welcome hug, the goodbye kiss, the embrace that lingers that much longer in the time of sorrow. I've discovered the palpable difference between such acts as mere gestures and the sluices of true feelings between two people. Then <clears throat> there is the troubling, at least for me, image of Sotomayor in some way expressing the emotion of an, of an exile. Uh, it's there in the epigraph. Uh, taken, taken from the uh, poem, uh, a poem by Jose Gutierrez Benitez. <coughs> and I'll, I'll read the, uh, uh, the part that's quoted and then translated into English. Uh, the poem is titled To, to Puerto Rico. Uh, Forgive the exile, this sweet frenzy. I return to my beloved world in love with the land where I was born. Uh, the poet. Uh, here is referring to his beloved Puerto Rico. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor was born in New York City, in the Bronx. We know she loved her abuelitas, both of them, and we know she loved going to Puerto Rico to see her maternal relatives. Compounding the problem for me is the image in the epilogue, this is at the very end, uh, where she's being sworn, uh, sworn in as Chief Justice. <coughs> this is the, the last paragraph. Then I caught the eye of the president sitting in the first row and felt gratitude bursting inside me. An overwhelming gratitude unrelated to politics or position, a gratitude alive with Abuelita's joy and with a sudden memory, an image seen through the eyes of a child. 
I was running back to the house in my awareness with a melting ice cone, uh, with a melting ice cone we called a piragua, uh, running sweet and sticky down my face and arms. The sun in my eyes breaking through clouds and glinting off the rain-soaked pavement and dripping leaves. I was running with joy, an overwhelming joy that arose simply from gratitude for the fact of being alive. Along with the image, memory carried these words from a child's mind to time. I am blessed in this life. I am truly blessed. So the text is framed by, by these two images, um, the, the poet's words and then her image of her as a child in, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, it seems to me that despite her many accomplishments, the separation from the island remains an unresolved issue for her. Sonia Sotomayor has written a very interesting book. She says in the preface that it had never occurred to her to write a memoir. She does share that she was approached on numerous occasions with questions about how she managed managed such success. Of course, underlying those questions was the implicit idea that someone like her wasn't supposed to rise so high. She admits as much, quote, underlying all these questions was a sense that my life story touches people because it resonates with their own circumstances. The challenges I have faced, among them material poverty, chronic illness, and being raised by a single mother, are not uncommon but neither have they kept me from uncommon achievements. For many, it is a source of hope to see someone realize her dreams while bearing such burdens. Most essentially, my purpose in writing is to make my hopeful example accessible. People who live in difficult circumstances need to know that happy endings are possible." Close quote. It's clear to me that Sotomayor has accomplished yet another objective in her remarkable life. There are uh, some beverages over the back and some trays of uh, some pastries. Please help yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> you did say that, right? Murder in the first degree. <laughs> they kept telling me. Victor, I have a question. Yes. Uh, obviously, she is professionally successful. But do you think she would consider herself personally successful if her marriage did not work, she has no children? Does she define her success professionally or does she profession uh, personally as well? That's an interesting question. Um, I think because early in the, in the memoir she does say that one of the reasons for her deciding to go into law even, for, even inspired by, by Perry Mason, and she saw that there was a need for someone to be there to help people, like the people that she knew. Many people, uh, 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 you know, get into debt, they, 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 they would just uh, make some poor choices, but she was sure that a lot of that could be ameliorated, right, uh, if there were more people like her who might understand them. And so that's there, and she, and she does do that. She accomplished that all, all the way through. But uh, by the same token, um, there are some places, actually after, uh, so before she is sworn in as, because this, this does, the epilogue is, is when she's being sworn in as a, a, a Supreme Court Justice, okay? But it ends with her becoming the, uh, her first federal judgeship, okay? And as she is enjoying that kind of life, she is doing things to, uh, I don't know, someone might say to reinvent herself. Uh, she takes uh, dancing lessons, she does uh, yoga, she's learning how to do all different kinds of things that she hadn't had time to do before. So it seems to me like there is a sense of maybe her, her personal self not having uh, reached the point that, that she would like. At least that's, that's my, my sense. Yeah, on that account, I found it very uh, troubling, or no, if not troubling, very painful that she had to ask for hugs. Well, that's, you yeah. know, in, by way of you have to give somebody instructions to hug you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's really, truly a painful kind of admission. Uh, that, that, that goes back to uh, her immediate home life, right? The, 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 the parents, the, the father who was, um, was alcoholic, 
Her mother didn't know how to, how to cope with that. Um, her mother and, and ends up uh, becoming, I think, like a, a, a licensed or vocational nurse. Right? And uh, she's an incredible model, incredible model for, uh, uh, for, for Sonia uh, and is always encouraging her, her education. But she did not know what to do about her husband's drinking problem. So she would leave him. She would go to work to avoid being with him. And the kids are there with him. And he wasn't abusive. He, wasn't, he neglected them, but he wasn't you know, uh, like physically abusive of them. And there was this, the, the quiet that I was referring to, that uh, um, the TV that kind of changes. You know, that, when I was reading, that was so painful. Your father is right there, right? Uh, you know, and I don't know, maybe it's like, ah, do your homework. You know, it's a good time, nice and quiet for reading and, and for homework, right? But, you know, there, there was a lot of um, contact, right? Physical contact, time with, with family that she doesn't enjoy growing up. Right? She's living in New York City, there, there is the extended family, and when things were okay, when the parents would agree, they would go to some uh, social uh, parties. They would go party to parties uh, at her father's family. Okay? But it, once this drinking gets worse, that's, that this continues. So as yeah, she's growing up, yeah, so that, that's a big gap. It sounded a bit like this Puerto Rican identity was was one of her in self inventions. Is, is that what you meant to convey? That she sort of frames the story with Puerto Rico, which is born in the U.S. And well, yeah, but uh, kind of an imagined one. Yeah, like the utopia that, that maybe right. could have been, but that, that seems to to me to be the suggestion, right? right? And also, I don't know. Um, the, the figure of Jose Cabran is as someone who was the, the counsel at, at Yale, right, but also had been counsel to the governor of Puerto Rico. I don't know if, if she has any interest at all in maybe doing something with, uh, with Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, but I think from her childhood, you know, there was always something that was missing or absent. Instead of that. Although the descriptions of her, of her mother's experiences growing up over there, you know, yeah, you better run away. <laughs> it's awful. It's awful. Um, the way the mother was uh, was taken advantage of by her own sisters. Right? Um, yeah, so this is this is uh, uh, a mean, Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, a, 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 a utopic kind of vision of um, the Puerto Rican life. I'm sure it's not only because she liked the coconuts in Puerto Rico, <laughs> <laughs> which she describes. She describes very. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm familiar with coconuts only like at H-E-B. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she talks about, you know, those coconuts, right, the, the ones with the brown, you know, kind of skin on it and all that, that's not a real coconut. I don't know. No, the real coconut is the green one. You're able to cut it very easily and you drink it the, the coconut milk and everything. So I learned that. I don't know. I don't want to have one of those now. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great book. I'm glad that... Uh, I decided to, to read it. So some regrets.